Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Srinivas Asuri, who goes by Bash. Bash is the head of US operations for Roundsquare. Uh, Roundsquare is an AI engineering services company that operates in the US and India. Bash, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Spencer. Happy to be here. Looking forward to this. Yeah, we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks now. I'm glad to have you on as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, I know a little bit about what you've done, but just for the listeners, uh, what are some of the projects that you've been working on at Roundsquare lately? Roundsquare, actually, we are we are working on a real um, you know set of very interesting projects across multiple industries. Cool. Um, you know, on on the one side, we're working with with a mid sized bank uh, to to you know look at their entire lending operations and and create automation you know elements in those. Um, on the other flip side, we're working with a manufacturing firm to, you know, uh, use AI ML to detect uh, defective components right there on the manufacturing floor. We've got a bunch of, uh, of of projects on the anvil with healthcare companies, all the way from, you know, um, on the insurance side, looking at how you you manage the claims processing and the billing and all of that, and then on the on the um, the actual provider side, helping the doctors with looking at CT scan images and, and, and trying to, you know, predict on uh, early stage onset of diseases and so on and so forth. So it's a myriad set. And strangely, Spencer, uh, uh, a, a good mix of my clients is actually software companies, uh, product companies, platform companies that have an application suite that's, that's already, um, you know, in, uh, in, in production. And they call us in and say, hey, can you look into our application suite and create automation elements in, in there? Um, so a good chunk of our uh, revenue comes from from software companies. I um, never thought that would, I would be not the have case, thought but... that either. To be honest, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it, just the way it turns out. Yeah, I don't know to what extent you're allowed to go into those projects, but I'd be really interested in kind of learning. I don't know the sort of things like a company approaches you for, where they want to go more in the artificial intelligence space or more in the automation space. Um, are there any specific examples that you're you're authorized to discuss? Um, yeah, there's one or two that that's in the public domain that we can actually speak to. Um, cool. um, uh, one, this is something that's really close to my heart, something I'm truly proud of. Um, this is a company called Adelphoi. They're a nonprofit based out of actually your neck of the woods, Pennsylvania, um, in Latrobe cool. County is where they're headquartered, but they've got facilities all over uh, the state. What they do is um, um, is is take care of at risk youth, um, Spencer. What I mean by that is, um, um, you know, kids that struggle to fit in society are referred to them uh, by the court system. Um, and Adelphi then becomes everything for that child uh, from, you know, their boarding, lodging to their uh, to their health care, to their education, pretty much everything. Uh, wow. And it's a lot of responsibility. Uh, yeah. And yeah, when we when we went and met with them, um, you know, there are. In, in that leadership, a couple very forward-thinking individuals that uh, that I'm proud to call my friend today, actually. Um, but but what they said is, for some time now, they've been collecting data in terms of how the kids are performing within their uh, within their entire system. As you'd imagine, they have multiple programs that's possible for every incoming kid, right? Based on you know uh, stay options or or education options or healthcare options, because a lot of the kids need healthcare um, uh, support as well. Um, and they said, hey, can you can you actually create some kind of a recommendation engine for us that looks at, um, you know, the data for an incoming kid and then tells us what program is best suited for that child? That was the initial use case. So preliminarily um, healthcare, yeah. just to make sure I'm tracking here. Yes, so primarily cool. um, healthcare. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what we did is, uh, you know, we worked with them for a while, took a look at all of their tool systems um, and and actually put together this model that uh, that now um, looking at the data that comes in for every child recommends the most appropriate program that's available within, uh, you know, within the entire organization. Now, it, it also, you know, in terms of a report generates um, what kind of outcomes are likely and when this child is likely to complete the program. It, it gives you a bunch of parameters, um, but it's been, it's been so successful and um, uh, you know, they've been so happy with it that they actually decided to, to, um, uh, to spin this off as a separate entity 
they christened it first match. Yeah, uh, they owned it, right? I mean, nothing that we do is 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 our IP. It's uh, no, that can... work for hire, so they <laughs> own it. They spun this off, called it first match, and now we're actually implementing this with similar um, organizations, not just in Pennsylvania but across the state. Pretty cool. Um, and this is a fascinating project, and um, yeah, something that, like I said, yeah, hold close to heart. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I definitely also care about you know that sort of thing. I donated a bit of money to the Pittsburgh Youth Leadership a couple of years ago, uh, which takes at-risk youth on cross-country bike rides to keep them from joining gangs over the summer. And so, uh, yeah, also something I care about. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, just to be honest, uh, um, you know, a a first-generation immigrant like myself, right, you don't don't know some of these things. Uh, It's very... um, Um, you're not exposed to those kinds of situations. And when I went and met with them and saw what was happening and and realized, my God, the the real good work they were doing uh, and for us to be able to actually help them in in any way or form. uh, Yeah. Uh, Every once in a while, you know, uh, work is not just about business and and, and money. You end (laughs) up doing something that that truly, you know, lifts your spirits. And this is one of those. Yeah. Like I said, those folks were very forward thinking. And and, um, I I was very impressed with my first uh, time meeting them and have um, have continued to, you know, know, be impressed with uh, with what they do and um, how they how they carry themselves and the organization forward. That sounds really rewarding. Um, I guess just, I, I work well with examples. And so like anecdotally, was there anything you saw there, like any particular client cases maybe where, you know, your software was able to help someone that might not have otherwise gotten the help where it kind of clicked um, for you, like we're doing something good here? Um, no, I don't think that's an area that I might be able to speak. Uh, I, I understand. About it, uh, it, it, yeah, it would concern specific individuals. No, or I was that. thinking more abstractly, but I, I understand. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah but this is somebody you can check out firstmatch.com or at elfoy.org. Um, you should be able to check those guys out. Um, I, they do good work. Yeah, sure. And no worries. Um, yeah. Um, so what else? Like what, what other things I guess have, have surround score put out in the world that you're proud of where. Yeah. Staying on the healthcare theme. Um, you know, uh, we did a project and this is, this is, I think back in India where, uh, you look at um, um, uh, you look at these scan images, DICOM images for um, you know for patients, um, and and looking at um, uh, all kinds of data, predict early stage detection of um, of DVD, deep vein thrombosis, um, and and yeah, I know my my technical folks will tell me that you know we used uh, uh, Google's TensorFlow and all that kind of stuff, but at the end of the day, to be able to predict well before the onset of a particular disease, um, so that you know you can you can start tracking these patients uh, from the get go, so that you don't have to wait for for these diseases to actually manifest, um, but rather um, you know try and take some preventive care in in um, well ahead of time. Now this is something we even embarked over here. Um, we haven't yet done anything about it, but uh, we were working with a group here to look at, um, um, you know, uh, problems um, that that people have that are of neurological uh, kind, you know, Parkinson's and um, those kinds of situations. Look at CT scan images and create a national database. This was a very ambitious project. Create a national database of uh, of candidates um, that are likely to uh, to 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 contract neurological disorders uh, later in life. And just like we do with uh, with colonoscopy today, right? They tell you yeah. you've done 50 or whatever, go get yourself a colonoscopy. Well, I think this what they wanted on. to do is, uh, uh, you know, have a, uh, a scan done for the entire, um, you know, database of people and maintain a, uh, a short list of, of candidates that are likely to contract these diseases and then help them. Because from what we understood in those early early conversations, um, these are not diseases that are easy to treat once they have set in. Agreed. But if you catch them early, that's your best chance to be able to treat them. And these are debilitating uh, diseases. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's, still, it's still something that we're talking to them about, but... Um, uh, but yeah, that's another area that... Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. And I, I actually 
have quite a bit of love for the biomed sector as well, um, having worked on prosthetics and uh, some medical uh, technologies, and then also, um, you know, some uh, first aid devices as well. Uh, my dad's an orthopedic surgeon. My granddad was a cardiologist, and um, oh. I have a very good friend who is also on the podcast, uh, Dr. Ken Yurish, who did some research into artificial intelligence in the early 2000s uh, for diagnostic medicine and up until now. Um, and so I, um, yeah, this is an area I care a lot about and I'm really interested in. So it'd be fun to kind of dig into the nuts and bolts of this uh, to the extent that we can. I, I know you're more on the business side of things. So if I get too technical, let me know, but I'm kind of curious. I, I want to I have so many questions. So from a user perspective, I guess I'm interested. It sounds like your, your main input is CT scans. So can I, can I ask like how you're able to identify like what sort of things you pay attention to in a CT scan or do you not even know because um, the AI abstracts that away so much that like a human wouldn't even be able to interpret that because it's sandwiched somewhere in a neural net. Okay. I'm going way off on the limb here. Um, sure. And this is way off my, my pay grade, not a data scientist, but my, my chief data scientist um, um, at, at round square, he, he is like a professor um, and, and he, when he explains things in brass stacks terms to me, um, you know, sometimes things stick. And I'm and I and I'll just give you an analogy of uh, you know the way the way this was explained to me in terms of how we handle video images. And this not, might not necessarily be the DVD scenario, uh, but basically you you take those images, cut those, uh, take the videos, uh, break them down into individual images, and then. Each of those images are, are are a bunch of pixels, right? 1024 by 768, so so many million pixels. Now, each of those pixels has a RGB code associated with it. Right. So if you run the math and you drive it down to that level, basically, it's like a microscope. What you're doing is looking for anomalies at a very, very intricate level and trying to match that with a database in the background of people that have had those kinds of problems before. So when that shows up, you know that this is this is something that you've got to look out for, that this is a likely candidate to form that disease. So it's almost like a, like, I mean, the way, um, the, way the algorithm works is, um, is like a, you know, like a deep microscope into, into that situation. So I'm just- This is how we do the, go ahead. So I'm hearing like just straight up pattern matching. That's basically what it sounds it's like. Very simplistically, very simplistically. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it goes way beyond my pay grade too. I'm not a data scientist either. I've hired people to do TensorFlow and data science, but it doesn't yeah. mean I can do and, it. And half the job, and half the job in 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 you know all of the work that we do, especially some of the innovation side work that we do, is is identifying which algorithms, which models are best suited for the use case. Um, you know that that's being presented right there are a bunch of these that are already out there no one's um, actually uh, recreating or or writing fresh algorithms all the time that's cool uh, there are a bunch in the public domain already and and i think um, um the smart um, uh, value is is in identifying um you know which one fits a use case the best yeah i'm sure that's good to your customers too team, yeah, and I think that's where our team's actually done done so well. And this is not just, I mean, I, I, I know I spoke about video case studies, but, uh, you know, we do some, uh, I mean, it, it's a whole whole spread. Like one of the projects that we did um, is where you listen to doctor notes. Um, and so when you go visit with a doctor, right, the doctor um, has to make a summary of, of the visit. Yeah, and oftentimes they'll dictate speak. that. Yeah, and often they speak their notes uh, after that visit. Um, and and what we do is uh, listen to that to that notes and then try and extract uh, information from it uh, in terms of you know whether what kind of disease and you know what kind of medication and all that kind of details and see if you can assign common billing codes for insurance claims purposes. There are so many levels that that's working on. You're doing speech recognition then you're trying to interpolate data from that. So I think I see where you're going, but I should probably listen. Sure yeah, and, and, and this is not something that we're doing for all the, you know, I guess 3000 plus uh, billing codes that are out there. Uh, just take the few commonly used uh, diagnosis codes and then, uh, you know, build off of there. And these are active learning tools. Uh, and, and, and I mean, you and I know the world's gonna change like, uh, <laughs> 
uh, like nobody's business in the next few years as these models continue to learn and and, and improve and get better. Well, for sure. Uh, eventually, we'll start seeing a lot of automation in these um, in these um, systems. Yeah, I, I'm continually impressed with with the things that you know data science is contributing to society and just some of the things my friends that are data scientists and you know some of the things you tell me about and just I mean it's it boggles my mind not being that kind of engineer because I can't do that. So, so it's yeah. very cool. Yeah. Yeah, there are some others in that whole healthcare space which is uh, which is on the insurance side, not as glamorous or as uh, you know. Uh, Got to pay the bills. Great, it's still important. Yeah. Uh, like, for example, discrepancies, right, between payers and providers, uh, what they claim and what's actually paid out. There are lots of discrepancies. And a lot of time, effort is is spent on trying to reconcile these. We're also, you know, trying to work with the, a few companies um, to see if you can use ML to do at least some part of this reconciliation process. So I'm hoping eventually this mess that we call a healthcare system here um, <laughs> will have ironed itself out because because of a lot of these kinds of interventions. And 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 I'm sure that there's well over a trillion dollars in terms of research and 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 projects and innovation going on in this space. So, I believe that. Yeah, um, I'm I'm generally an optimist at heart, so I'm, I'm hoping uh, <laughs> you know, that it's not going to get progressively worse. It's going to get progressively better. Yeah, for sure. No, I, I feel the same way. Um, yeah. So, okay, so this brings me to kind of a, an interesting theme where a lot of times it sounds like you're trying to detect an outlier. So like, be it like a bad component that's been manufactured, uh, you know, maybe I should say non-conforming rather than bad, um, or like you want to find a disease that, you know, you're, you're trying to detect um, early on in its development so you can intervene, or you want to figure out just something that's not meant to be. And I know, I know that's not everything, like selecting insurance for, you know, an at-risk kid isn't like an outlying condition, it's a decision. But when you detect an outlier with one of your applications, do you typically alert a human agent? Does your system act on its own? How does that work operationally for the client usually? Yes, so you'd actually you'd actually create an alert right now that that a human needs to get involved. So, uh, you know, when, when, we, when I talk to my folks, uh, we never use the term AI. Uh, they always say ML. AI inherently seems to suggest that there's no human intervention, whereas pretty much all of the work that we do today is just machine learning. Uh, it's not truly AI in the sense that you know it runs and goes off on its own, and you know it's got a life and soul of its own. No, um, yeah, there is there is human intervention in everything we do. So if you if you're creating that scan, for example, it'll actually you know uh, highlight that this person has this uh, percentage likelihood of contracting this disease later on in life. And then it means that a human needs to look at that and then do whatever is required in terms of, you know, tracking, monitoring that. That patient. makes sense. So at that point, you know, like in that example, a physician would verify the claim and then, you know, get after it basically. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. And not, not everything that we do is, you know, uh, anomalies, right? Um, this bank that I was telling you about, uh, when when we when we got pulled into the bank, what what had happened is um, they had consistently missed their uh, their targets, uh, lending targets to uh, to minority groups. Oh right? wow! Now, yeah, and 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 I guess this is a this is a universal problem for for a lot of the banks, and uh, so they were actually getting um, you know government was actually probing them to understand why these loans were being denied and and. There are several valid reasons why this is happening. So initially, when they called us in, they said, "Hey, can you can you look at these models and 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 you know help us understand if it's got some inherent biases that it's developed over time?" That was the initial reason, uh, you know, we got called in sure. uh, because I mean you, these models get built by the data scientists in your in-house team, but. Uh, it's almost like software testing, right? You don't want the same development team to do the testing because you yeah, you, amen to that. you want it to look good. You don't want the fox guarding the hen house. In, in I completely system. agree. And we'll always have different developers test code for our clients before we release to the client or even a testing team. Yeah. You shouldn't, so we you shouldn't peer review your own stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we actually went in trying to do that validation exercise to begin with. But having done that um, and, 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 you know, having having some degree of success with that, uh, they actually now had us, uh, you know, looking at the entire lending process from from the uh, from the acquisition to the disbursement. 
and 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 they have you know set internal goals in terms of you know uh, time to cash, time to approve, you know, uh, time to disperse, and so on and so forth. And they they want to crash some of those times. So we are helping with the entire data strategy there, in terms of you know um, looking at how the data is structured, um, looking at specific use cases that that we can and and we've got a whole bunch of use cases already identified in that entire process. And then we're reimagining that using uh, using ML. Can I ask, like, to see how we can improve. what are some of the discovery, discoveries you've made or procedural changes that have come out that have made banking maybe like more racially fair? Um, yeah, these are these are not things that I can. Um, yeah, I understand. Actually, no, I mean you get paid to do the work because there are, there are certain. I'll shift to a different industry to, because I. Uh, this is. Um, yeah, I can't talk about the bank specifically, but sure. I no, I mean I ask a lot of probing questions, so I apologize if that's that's fair. On the spot. So. So a publishing house, for example, right, that that makes um, that writes books or reference material or textbooks or whatever. Now we all know that many of these textbooks that have been written in the past need to be redone. Uh, for example, yeah, we all know there are books out there that would say uh, the doctor examined the patient and then he said. So there's the assumption inherently that the doctor's male. Oh, I see. Okay, and yeah. Yeah, there are a bunch of these kinds of examples across reference material, um, and you've got models that that would actually scan these these digital ebooks um, and pull out these statements, pull out these what we now recognize as offensive statements, yeah. put them into you know some kind of report that says, hey, this is the statement, this is the corrected sentence that we'd recommend, and then have somebody, an editor types, actually look at those and say, okay, uh, accept, almost like. Get a human uh, like involved. Changes button on Word. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. So in this so case, those, it those sounds are the like the things we do here as well. That's cool. So in that particular yeah. case, you're looking for like instances of he and her, and probably just anything that's not gender neutral, and then that sets up a flag that gets a person involved, and then at that point, you know, the editor has a choice to make, you know, to make the thing gender neutral. Gender neutrality is one. Others are, you know, um, you know. Um, like like for example they'd say darker skinned people like my skin's dark right darker yeah. skinned people are more likely to contract skin diseases for example or or skin cancer kind of stuff they all have to be rewritten to conform to uh, to today's sensibilities so it, you can catch all of those kinds of things and the same kind of uh, biases in the banking models are also identified and sure. corrected. I know nothing about skin cancer or how that's contracted, but is it is it like a medical fact that a darker skinned person as opposed to a lighter skinned person is more likely to get skin cancer? Uh, e even if it is, it's not the way that it should be uh, projected. There are okay. different ways they'd like for this to be written. And and that is where we look at. Uh, I'm not looking at the fact itself. I have no clue, no idea. That makes. I don't know either. I'm just. I'm just curious. Yeah, we. Yeah, when when we when we embark on these kinds of use cases, we are given specific uh, direction in terms of what they're looking for, what they want us to identify, and that's how you know we we set up these kinds of uh, models. Sure. Um. I just again, I, this is just me being just maybe not the most informed, but. How would you reword a sentence like that? Like, I, I guess I'm just trying to come up with a rules engine in my head because I'm not a data scientist, so it's the closest analog I've got. And then when that model breaks, just to give you an idea of what I'm trying to do here, I want to be like, okay, now how do you fix that with data science? <laughs> so, it's, yeah, it's like so the five-minute approach. Suppose, yeah, I, I suppose you'd uh, you'd go off to technical terms over there and and talk about um, you know photosynthesis and and uh, whatever that photo. Um, language that you'd use that presence uh, of a certain pigment or something medical stuff yeah yeah okay yeah no that makes sense all right do you do you typically for stuff like that like would you employ i mean i would think you would have to employ a lookup table like you wouldn't just be able to do that purely mathematically because it's based on human convention at, at the time of the program being run so you almost would need to look that up in a table but that doesn't mean it's not data science. I mean, you, you look at, you know, the probability offensive, then you go to this one from here. And then I would think maybe there's some kind of hashing that occurs. But again, this is, this is me as an engineer trying to figure it out. You know, <laughs> so. No, for this particular one that you're speaking about, it's a Google algorithm. Uh, it's their, um, their in-house, their developed algorithm that they've 
put out in the public domain. Oh, cool. Um, and, and you can actually, Wikipedia uses this as well. Interesting. Um, so you can actually use those same algorithms to, to scan these entire documents, cull out these specific um, offensive pieces, and then use a different one to, to correct them. Yeah. Well, and obviously that wouldn't be practical to do just purely with humans because, you know, it would, you don't want to read the Encyclopedia yeah. Britannica before breakfast, right? And so <laughs> we're talking about thousands and thousands of these kinds of material. Thankfully, they're yeah. all available in uh, in e form, right? So they're yeah. all available online, digital form. So it become easier to scan and, and, and do all that kind of stuff. Yeah. As you'd imagine, right? There's a lot of money going towards this kind of initiatives right now. Um, because you you want to make those kinds of corrections. So, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, yeah. I was I was particularly fascinated just with the, fascinated with the way books are scanned in general. Like just looking at that process mechanically. I don't know. You've probably looked at this um, just because you've you've been working on this. But I think Google Scholar and Google Books um, were doing this where they would cut the spine off a book with a giant saw and then feed it through a, basically just a Xerox scanner. And that's how they'd get it in. So I always thought that was interesting. Like, you know, it's a destructive process, which, you know, and then I have a friend in school that made a robot that did it, but it would use a piece of rubber on the end of an arm to turn the page. So you'd have basically your book is held up like that. And then you've got a camera looking at that page, another camera looking at that page. Then you've got a finger that comes down and peels this page up. So it sort of curls out around. And then you've got another finger that comes in with plastic and flips it over. And then you take two more pictures. It wasn't perfect. Uh, the non-destructive one, I, I saw it turn three pages at a time more than once. But uh, it's interesting to see different approaches to that problem. Yeah, a lot of the challenges that you face uh, in that whole defect detection one that I spoke to you about, the the manufacturing one, uh, arriving at the at the model um, to 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 identify, uh, you know, the the component coming out as defective was not the hard part. The hard part was mounting the cameras in such a way <laughs> that the technicians don't come in the way of the actual video, recognizing which of the videos have been tainted. How should the lighting be? Oh, that's a real bear for everybody in this so, industry. So that took so much time, especially as you'd imagine in COVID time, right? You can't uh, go into these factories as well. Um, so it, th that was... How did you replicate the factory work. setup when you couldn't go in? Because that, that to me is interesting. I feel like that doesn't cross any IP boundaries. Yes. So uh, so, so the client in this case actually enabled a whole lot of um, uh, this testing in, in the lab format. Sure. So it, within their labs, they allowed us to run all of these uh, test cases, fine-tune it over there. And once that was accomplished, then we used, um, uh, you know, specific videos as simple as this Google Meet kind of, you know, videos and, and you know, the technicians walking through, placing the cameras, oh, cool. mounting the cameras in terms of angles and all that. And we're looking at it. So it it, it was arduous, but that was the only way you could get it done. Been this there. was important enough for them. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So you, I've had to do that so many times where it just adds development time, but sometimes there's no getting around it where you've got a really good engineer that's in a different state, but you need them over here to look at this particular circuit because you've got this trace wrong, or you know you want to run a test and you know your data scientists are not at the client site and they're constrained because of COVID and international travel and all that stuff. So you know you have to open up a comms link and look at it that way. That's that's interesting. Yeah, and you know, uh, yeah, uh, and these are all you know absolutely R and D kind of projects, right? Pilot projects and. Uh, nobody in our data science team had heard the term brazing when we first came across this. Yeah. So uh, you'd imagine that, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it's taken some work to get to this point. But uh, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, that's awesome. Did you find that an understanding of the brazing process helped your data scientists to analyze it better? Uh, yes, it did. We actually roped in an expert as well, um, cool. and, uh, uh, an industry expert um, in, into this project. And uh, that person gave us a lot of perspectives in terms of, you know, um, how this might be done. But, but yeah, That's awesome. um, it was a learning curve in terms of understanding the, the, the manufacturing technology piece of it first before understanding how you could actually solve it. That's incredible. And, and I think that kind of speaks to me as an engineer, because I always try to do that when I get involved in a, um, we'll say, exotic project. Um, like, you know, for instance, when I've worked on, um, you know, uh, prosthetics or, or surgical robots. I always tried to understand the surgery or the anatomy being worked with. And 
Um, one time I, I was called into a cadaver lab and you know, I probably shouldn't say for what surgery because that'll get me in trouble and ID the client too closely. But um, I, I observed a certain type of surgery and I watched videos of it over and over and over again on YouTube. So I wouldn't be the person that couldn't stand the sight of blood or, you know, and I also wanted to understand it because the qualifying surgeon in this particular surgery said that I might be offered a chance to um, make some cuts with a bone saw for my Facebook photos. So <laughs> I really, really wanted to get a picture of me dressed like a surgeon doing a surgery in a cadaver lab. Um, you. They, they wouldn't yeah. allow me to do it. The project manager intervened. <laughs> but um, I, I tried. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, knowing that stuff, you know, I was able to get some of these bids and, you know, introduce the right anatomical language into the software and, and then to the hardware. And I think just have better insights that I was doing the right work. I think it's a misconception and, and one that I've probably been led into myself that, you know, data science is somehow magical. And for that reason, you don't need the same domain expertise that you would to do strict mechatronics or, you know, the type of engineering I do. And it sounds like that's just a fallacious, you know, misconception and, and kind of it's sobering to hear that. Like, I, I appreciate you teaching me that. Yeah. And, and you know, that's that's the beauty of what we do here at Round Square. And, and I don't want to toot my own uh, horn over here, but... But the guys that started this company, and I wasn't one of the original founders, uh, I came on board later. Uh, the guys pretty much like like me. But what happens is in the in the in the large IT services world, you're doing a bunch of stuff where you're just chasing revenue. Uh, yeah, you're doing. I, I don't want to downplay some of the other activities that we do, but uh, yeah. but you know these guys just wanted to narrow their focus down to to data and and ML. And if it means that, yeah, you need to do some some bit of BI and some reporting and you, you know, need to create mobile apps, you need to create some web applications, we'll do all of that. But 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 we wanted to start with the premise that we're data and NML folks. And I think in, in, in three years, we've actually lived up to that uh, to that to that vision, to that expectation. Some of the projects that we do, you know, uh, my wife tells me, uh, uh, Spence, all the time that, you know, she hasn't seen me so excited about my work in a very long time. It's awesome, Bash. And it feels good to be in that place. I'll say the same. Yeah, it, this is, yeah, I've been working for a very long time. It, this is <laughs> 20 plus years. And uh, yeah, it, it's almost like, you know, you, you refine your mojo. Uh, literally, and, and that's what happened. That, and and the beauty about 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 working with multiple industries is, you know, some of the some of the and some of the people that you meet and some of the people that you get to work with is, uh, at least for me, uh, a blessing. Like sure. some of these doctors, some of these doctors that we're working with. I mean, I don't I don't understand uh, even even the terminology. Uh, you know, I actually have to look up on Google what they're talking. Uh, but 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 you know it it takes both sides to try and understand each other to come up with the solutions that that in their case are literally life saving. Um, and, yeah. And, um, some of these people are um, way ahead of the curve, um, and, and I'm really blessed blessed to be, you know, meeting them, speaking to them. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree. Right. I I told you one of my favorite sectors is biomed. I mean, and. It's not just biomed. I like manufacturing. I like logistics. I like biomed. I love biomed. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I work in manufacturing now. Um, so, I, you know, I obviously love that too. But um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I'll be honest. Personally, biomed is my favorite sector because you just feel really good working on it. And, you know, you're, you're helping people. And, and there's lots yeah, of Yeah, I never there. have. I've, I've been on the manufacturing side of things, you know, for the longest period of time. So a lot of these projects in the healthcare, I find that very, very <laughs> Crossed uh, over interesting. There. Yeah, I find that, <laughs> yeah, but both of us. And, <laughs> you know, even simple things like, you know, uh, clinical trials. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we wrote an app for a company that, uh, that allowed, um, you know, people in the clinical trial, right? Those who are uh, in the program to actually record their, uh, their their feedback. So the key part of, a, of of any of these kinds of trials is to be able to get that accurate information. Sure. Now, you don't want that person taking something and then saying, oh, I'll go back home and upload it, you know. Um, Real time is always phone. better. Yeah, so you actually just speak it into, into, into your phone. You say, hey, try it, the, the app opens up, 
and then you speak your um, you know what whatever is going on with you and the app calls out the useful information and 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 populates it in the in the back end that's awesome uh, it, it, yeah it, it's it's really it sounds like you really probably use similar to tech to the doctor transcription <laughs> on that. yeah it, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, similar kind of applications. But you see how many areas within that entire oh, for sure. it's, it's able to uh, impact. And and yeah, we've got some some really nice um, um, use cases across that industry. Um, yeah, yeah, a lot of the the revenue comes from from banking and insurance and finance and, and manufacturing, but um, it's it's not really as as um, as close to your heart as I guess some of these healthcare examples might be. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, I, I love the healthcare industry. I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we can start doing biomedical work at FormLogic with some of the stuff we do in manufacturing, because then I get to combine the two, which would be great. But right now all of our clients are aerospace. Um, so a good friend of mine, um, and, and this is completely off topic, nothing to do with what we do. He was good. telling me that he, he started a um, additive manufacturing company oh, cool. uh, and he's a manufacturing guy too. And, um, you know, he was initially thinking of, you know, making and supplying components to the aerospace industry. Uh, but he found there were lots of uses in the, uh, in the actual healthcare field as well. For example, these cartilages that, that, that that's for your nose or for your ear yeah. are very difficult to create. Um, um, Interesting. And, and, they're making those using these uh, these um, these machines, like a scaffold um, or the cartilage itself. I, I would think a scaffold. The, the actual cartilage. Wow. So if, if somebody's had a you know a, a a surgery and you need to replace this part, you can actually manufacture one using additive manufacturing. Like, I talked to a guy today whose son was in a uh, motorcycle accident where he lost like a big chunk of his face. And apparently they were able to 3D print a titanium insert that got his eye back into the correct position, yeah. utilizing, yeah, I mean, well, it's 3D right? printed, it's out of the, by definition. So I thought that was pretty cool. Fascinating. Yeah, when this guy was telling me about it, I was like, blown out of my mind, this is, this is really, you know, and he said, the way he, he, he was actually talking about it, he said, uh, yeah, this is, these are use cases that I'd never even imagined that we'd get into. Okay, and, and lo and behold, you find yourself um, pivoting. That's awesome. I would yeah. think there's a bunch of challenges too with doing that kind of stuff. Cause I mean, to make things bio safe is tricky. 3d prints by nature tend to be porous, but if you're printing actual cartilage, which, and I'm not enough of a bioscientist to understand how that works, but I'm just going to assume it works. Um, then I guess that gets around that because it gets accepted into the body somehow. That's interesting. Like that's, that's pretty cool. My, my yeah, cousin. I, I... Yeah, I yeah, I wouldn't even try to. Yeah, no, I, I don't uh, either. My my cousin pioneered yeah. a, a decent amount of that tech. With um, he used to have like the first metal three D print in his office from the eighties, and um, he did a lot with three uh, D printing. He did scaffolding, which is why I assumed that he recently passed away. But while he was alive, he did scaffolding for um, organ regrowth and a bunch of experiments with that. Uh, I was with uh, one of the universities as a professor, and so um. That guy is always way smarter than me. And I, I just, whenever I was in his office, he could, he could make things make sense that made, I, like I was confused by controls theory one time and uh, PID controls in particular. And he gave me this lecture where I had taken an hour long class and I was confused as hell and none of it made any sense. And within 15 minutes, he had me understanding it. And I've, I've repeated that lecture to probably like a hundred people at this point. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, some people are like that, right? Yeah. But you can just it, 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 you become like a sponge in, in when when they're talking. You you really understand it, and um, yeah, it yeah. I've run into those kinds of people. I've actually been very fortunate, you know, being on the business side of things, Spencer. Uh, I I keep uh, I keep telling people from my first time from my first job onwards. Yeah, uh, you've met some real bright minds. Oh, you've for met sure, some Bash. Really interesting people. And, and I found that very, very invigorating, you know, very, um, yeah. There's a reason I like doing this podcast, Bash. <laughs> it's like yeah, it's exactly, about like you. exactly, <laughs> exactly. It gives you such a wide perspective of things and you, you end up meeting such, such a wide array of people. Yeah. Well, I've noticed too, with the interview format, you learn things about your friends and colleagues that, you know, 
it just they would have never told you if you hadn't been doing it like an interview. Like you ask these, I mean, I ask these deep penetrating questions and sometimes people will tell you something about themselves that you're like, oh my God, I didn't know you experienced that. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that, Those are the yeah. best ones. Uh, it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes people have like a sales pitch that they just want to stick to and, and it gets kind of laser focused in and they don't deviate and those episodes tend to not last as long. But when people I think really feel comfortable, you can, you can learn so much from them. And I think it's true organically in your career too. Like when you have somebody, that's what I was trying to recreate with this is that, you, well, you know this, cause you just talked about it. like th those moments you get with somebody that's done extraordinary things where they start telling you about stuff and you catch their perspective and you get a kind of a glimpse into their, their reality. And it's, it's quite yeah. nice. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. So I guess what are, can I ask like who some of those people are that you've gotten to interact with over the years where you've been kind of fortunate or. Um, you know, from the, from the very beginning, um, my first job uh, back in India um, was with this, um, was with this distributor of uh, multiple um, technologies, all American technology. I don't know if you remember, uh, this is really dating myself, but there used to be a company called Silicon Graphics that make these huge uh, machines that you'd use for all kinds of simulation purposes cool. and a bunch of engineering tools, CAD tools, CAE tools. Um, and uh, I used to meet a lot of people in, in, in the aerospace side of things and the automotive side of things Interesting. In, in general manufacturing. And, we would, and, and they would talk about, you know, uh, things that 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 would make me think I wish I'd paid more attention in engineering school you know, but, <laughs> but, but they take the time and I was and I was just so so honored from the get-go as a young kid to be able to be, meet you know you know these practical doyens of the industry for for all practical purposes and that just continued right I mean it, it it's it's um it's just gotten um bigger better I'm doing it even today yeah um, that's awesome and, uh, yeah, I've just been, it's been a, yeah. And like I said, I'm, I've been blessed. It's been a fascinating journey. Yeah, no, I consider so myself fortunate as well. I feel like in some ways the grass is always greener because I remember as a young engineering intern, just thinking, um, you know, like I was fascinated by the salespeople and the operations people and the executives and I wanted to be like them. And I was, I, I thought, you know, like these people are so charming and interesting and, you know, just on fire and I'm stuck in this engineer's body, you know, and I, <laughs> I, I would much rather, you know, be, you know, some executive. And so I, I always kind of aspired to that in those days. And now I'm somewhere in between. <laughs> yeah. An interesting aside. Okay. My, my father was a sound engineer. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, he, he went to work. Uh, uh, they needed him to win. And, and he did that for a very long period of time. Um, till one day his boss and you know sound engineering you have this big machine that, that basically you're you're managing the sound and uh, apparently the the head of that organization once came and asked him to uh, to produce a movie oh cool um, and, and, and he came home that day and and you know it, it's a long way back from work home for him and obviously he'd spent some time thinking and he came back and said you know what there's something something wrong with the way I've been living my life, if somebody else had to come and show me the potential of what I could do. I spent 20 years of my life just doing this machine stuff, whereas somebody else felt I had the, the potential, the capacity, the capability to do something bigger. He completed that, that movie that he needed to do, he delivered it and handed his resignation. <laughs> That's incredible. And he always told me that, you know, um, um, yeah, you know, as an engineer, um, It'd be great, you know, working with machines, but um, successful people in life, happier people in life sometimes also are those that actually uh, do well working with people. I completely uh, so agree. So you put that in my head early, I think. Uh, yeah. And I'm, it, it just came to me now speaking with you that uh, um, maybe that set me on a path. That makes sense to me. I actually, it's funny you should say that because when I was a kid, um, I want to say like seven years old, um, I met another kid in in kindergarten at the time and his dad was an audio engineer and he was building robots in his attic uh, to date myself this would have been in the mid 90s 
And so um, this was in the early day of this type of robot. He was building a robot to take CDs out of a, I think he, so he, he had like these arrays of 20 CD burners for his company and he'd burn CDs for, you know, basically musical artists. And then he'd have them blank and he'd put them in a pile of burned. And then he, he was building a robot to pull them out of that pile, stick them in a printer. The thing would, it was like a CD-ROM that fed it in slowly and would inkjet print over the top of it as it went in. And then he had the robot pull it back out of that and put it on a finished pile. And so he, he had this guy, Juan, that worked for him and he really wanted to replace Juan with a robot. And so that was one of my influences early on. <laughs> Just a kid was learning from this guy and he taught us all about transistor, transistor logic and relay logic. And we learned some rudimentary programming, you know, maybe feel like the age of like 13. I, I kind of learned from this guy. So like five years, six years yeah, of mentorship. No. Yeah. So. You know what? A, a, just a quick um, aside, I guess. There's a book I read, I think four or five years ago uh, called how music got free or how music became free. Um, I might have it somewhere there. Uh, I can send you the details. Yeah, I would like to. That is a fascinating read, Spencer. Um, um, there are there are several parallel stories happening. Okay, one is the actual piracy, right? You have people stealing from where the CDs are actually being manufactured. Uh, oh, physical. Second, that's interesting. Yes, physical. Uh, so yeah. that's what I said. Parallel story. There's there's one which describes in great detail the struggles of engineers in Germany that were trying to create this whole MP3 technology, and how they were being stymied at at every step. Okay, there's a bunch of uh, factors, and 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 the author goes goes. It's for me. It, it felt like a thriller. That book. Yeah, it, was it sounds so interesting. Well. There's the technology side. There's the real side. There's so much happening. And it all comes to a head and, 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 you know, music goes online and suddenly changes the landscape completely. It's a, it's a, oh, for sure. it's a really good read, very compelling read. How yeah. music got free, how music became free. How music became free. I gotta look that up. Yeah. How music got free. That's the name of the book. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. Stephen Witt. That's the author, Stephen Witt. Stephen Witt. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. That yeah. sounds like a lot of fun. I mean, I'm sure I'm not, the statute of limitations is long past on this, but I grew up with Napster in the 90s. So, remember, Yeah, they talk a lot about Napster and this whole peer-to-peer. Uh, LimeWire was a thing after that. that and there, there were a few so that was one of those parallel themes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they yeah. were all there. At one time, I remember, um, <laughs> my dad's retired now, so I'm not going to get him in trouble. He um he spent four hundred dollars of nineties money in order to buy all the equipment to pirate satellite television, and me and my <laughs> friend who was the audio engineer's son um, wrote a uh, a bash script um, pun not intended to uh, to boot an emulator. Uh, there was a printed circuit board that went into like a Direct TV box that emulated the card that told the box what channels you were authorized to buy. Then there was another card that was like, you know, they were going for like a few hundred dollars on eBay. That was an old one that they had phased out because they were reprogrammable. So I think, I don't remember exactly how it worked, but there was somehow it was like reading the data as to what channels you were supposed to have off this card, interjecting other bits of stuff, and then telling this card that you had all the channels. <laughs> we got it working yeah. for one day. And then my mom, who was an attorney, just made us shut the whole thing down. <laughs> You know, I always had a, garbage. Yeah, I always had a negative, uh, you know, connotation to this whole hacker thing, right? Till um, I think some, some several years ago, I heard Steve Wozniacki speak um, at one of uh, the Infosys company conferences. I used to work for Infosys, and uh, he spoke so fondly and so proudly of some of his hacker friends. Uh, you know, he said a couple of them are in jail, but I'm still proud of them. And it, nice. it changed my perspective on, 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 on hackers and not, not, and, and the way he presented it basically is not, not all hackers do things for profit. Yeah. They yeah. Just, I believe that. You know, and they actually end up helping improve the system. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's, that's a big part of it, right. Is, is identifying vulnerabilities and making things safer yeah. in that way. Um, I actually met a guy who was not that at one point in my life. Um, I, I hung out with this group of professionals when I worked in Milwaukee for the Joy Mining Corporation for a while. Uh, the story has nothing to do with them, but that's what I was doing in Milwaukee. And um, 
basically um i had been hanging out with this just a bunch of russian immigrants um and uh i'm like a third generation russian immigrant but these were a lot of first generation russian immigrants and um i had two roommates named dimitri one after the other uh little dimitri and big dimitri is often the russian moniker for two people with the same name and these were professionals um Little Dimitri um, was a project manager for the, uh, I'm sure you've heard of this company, Epic, that makes electronic medical records. Um, yeah, yeah. And Big Dimitri is, was a um, IT systems engineer for CDW. And um, Little Dimitri's wife, Nyestia, was a you know project manager for Caterpillar, uh, you know, which was one of our competitors at Joy. And, uh, you know, I mean, just, these are just professional, you know, like normal people. Um, and one of them there was this guy, Oleg, and Oleg was um, a security consultant. And so I never really knew what that meant, but I never questioned it too much. And so I'd been hanging out with this guy maybe for like two or three months, and um, we were drinking pretty heavily. And he goes, uh, do you want to know who I really am? And I'm like, uh, excuse me, what? He goes, do you want to know who I really am? And I'm like... I'm pretty sure I know who you are. We've been hanging out for like three months, man. Uh, you're you're Oleg, you know. He's like, no, 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 no. And then he like pulls it up on Wikipedia. He grabs this article, and it's uh, a guy named Oleg. It's his picture. It's a mugshot, and um, it's a different last name. And I went, wait, that's not the name you gave me in my phone. He goes, well, I gave you a fake name. <laughs> so, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, and so it turns out this guy was responsible for creating thirty three percent of the world's spam at the time. And so, wow, right? <laughs> so he had a that botnet crazy. of half a million infected computers that would generate the spam. And then according to Wikipedia, it was like ads for Rolex watches and Viagra and all this stuff that would go out. And then apparently when they got him, they seized like $20 million off him as like a tw early 20s kid. Um, he was at an auto show in Las Vegas um, where he's like, you know, we also had legitimate business interests. And so they were, he was doing this auto show. And I guess the, the U S marshals had, had been tracking him for a while. And finally they kind of closed the trap and he got um, sent into the, uh, the federal system. And so he, when I met him, he was, he had done three years in the federal penitentiary and he had done, like two and a half years and he was nearing the end of his sentence as a security consultant in Milwaukee, kind of helping the U S government figure out, you know, vulnerabilities and in, in our security and stuff like that. They had turned him, And so, I mean, he, he had to fire two lawyers to get to that point where he was labeled to ever walk free again. <laughs> it, was, it was interesting. Yeah. He had some really interesting perspectives. So I remember he had an online dating profile that he, he was AB testing different online dating profiles. So he had one where it was pictures of him up close. And then he had another one where it was pictures of him kind of further away and mysterious. And he's like, the mysterious one does better. You know, he's like, oh he, had, he had like stats on it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a really interesting person to observe, you know. Outrageous. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, it's really funny. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Apparently he did like, he like went on a date with a vice reporter. I'm guessing that they were doing like a, a piece on him. And so it was, it was a really... It was a really interesting guy to have met. Um, and so that's, I'll never forget that yeah. guy. <laughs> it reminds me of that movie, Catch Me If You Can. Oh, uh, for sure. You know, yeah, the one record, yeah. 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 They finally had him work for the FBI, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly it. Too smart for his own good. He's the best at it. So they wanted to hire him. Yeah. 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 Makes, makes sense. Yeah. 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 Interesting the people you run into in your lifetime, right? Oh, um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that guy was hiding in plain sight. I mean, I never would have known if he hadn't confided in me. Yeah, yeah that took a few drinks uh, uh, to, to get him to speak. But <laughs> if you search Wikipedia King of Spam, you'll find his his article because that was his nickname was the King of Spam. <laughs> so, oh, my pretty God. Pretty sure he's back in Russia now. But I, I had one roommate, um, the big Dimitri was very conservative and i asked oleg i'm like is, is that normal like in russia for people to be that conservative like just some old school beliefs we'll say and he goes no 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 dimitri is conservative even by russian standards <laughs> <laughs> pretty pretty funny yeah that, that's yeah. interesting yeah for sure hopefully i don't get in trouble Great. for my racist russian accent but i think i'll be a fine <laughs> yeah i actually realized that um 
you know, some of the areas that the Russians are really good at. Actually, all of Eastern Europe, um, uh, engineering and, uh, and, and all of this data science. So in the early days, when, when I used to do a lot of work with Boeing, uh, which was a client of mine. Cool. Uh, Boeing was getting a lot of um, engineering design work done. Uh, they had, I think, their own facility somewhere in Eastern Europe and, and a bunch of those folks working for them because they they really had that talent. I believe uh, what, what happened is when the USSR, you know, broke down and spun off, there were a lot of these engineers that, that were working for the erstwhile, um, you know, USSR communist government that now became free. And um, they were really, really talented people and, and, and Boeing had hired a bunch of them. And I'm hearing the same thing on this go around with data science as well. Interesting. Um, this, this entire uh, Russia, uh, Ukraine, that whole area, uh, because um, you, know, you know how certain types of people have a certain propensity for certain sciences. So it, it, in this case, they're very good at math, uh, just like a lot of people in India are, which is why we, you know, we were so good in software development and all of that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, data science is really catching, um, um, you know, catching fire in that whole That's awesome. Eastern European belt. Yeah. Now we have a it's bunch of Eastern European yeah. engineers on the team at Formlogic that live in Eastern Europe and, and will come in and, and work alongside us. Yeah, India had that one advantage that, you know, most of us speak uh, English. We may have heavy, heavily accented English, but we still, you know, uh, can speak the language, read, write the language. So I, I, I guess we got off to a, uh, to a quicker start. Um, but yeah, some of these guys are supposed to be really, really good at it. Yeah, like, for like sure. Shows. Yeah, no, all, all the guys on our team speak English, um, which, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. Uh, we have, we have a bunch of, um, yeah, Eastern Europeans that speak English on our team who are, who are very good. It's interesting because we do, um, you know, work on national defense for like ITAR. Uh, well, it's not really national defense. It's any rocket part is considered ITAR because it could be used as a missile. I, I'm remembering my SpaceX training from when I used to be an intern there. And so, you know, that what, yeah. what they sat us down and lectured us on is, you know, that rocket get turned into a missile and sent right back at us. So <laughs> you better not let yeah. those blueprints get out. And so... You kind of get it, but it still is kind of weird to have like certain coworkers that you can't share information with because you know you're you're all on the same team and so. Yeah, it's always challenging. Um, it's always challenging when you're working with um, anything remotely defense. Um, yeah, we did a we did some work for for Lockheed Martin a long time ago. It was it had nothing to do with their defense work. Uh, it was something to do with um, with I think. Uh, um, census, the UK census project they were about. working on. So it was really nothing to do with anything to do with defense, but, and, and they needed a lot of people to actually execute those projects. I would imagine um, it sounds really, really complicated. Yeah. But because they, they couldn't allow you to get into Lockheed's networks, uh, there was a very <sighs> complicated multi-barrier, uh, multi-firewall system to be able to, like, you know, who the hell had to maintain that? That must've been an yeah, IT and, nightmare. It, it it really was setting that whole thing up was a nightmare, and I, I and I told you right uh, while at Infosys we were doing a lot of work with Boeing, a few of our guys were served subpoenas. They didn't know what a subpoena was, <laughs> okay, yes. but they were served for what? Because because so uh, so organizations like Boeing, right? Even a, even a seven three seven aircraft, for example, can be do uh, can be deemed dual use, right? Because you sell it as as cargo planes to uh, to the military. Oh, that right? makes sense. So some of the work that our guys were doing might have been, um, you know, impacting something else. And so they got served. Uh, I mean, obviously they were, they were interviewed and, and came out clean, but, but yeah, it does get complicated. That whole defense sector can be, um, um, can be a little. Have you ever been interviewed for somebody's, uh, what, like a U.S. government, um, security clearance? No, that's a no. weird interview. I, I, I've, I've done it once in my career. And um, there's an engineer I worked with who was working for Raytheon at the time on defense work. And um, he had done some work for me previously. And I was one of the people that he named as, as you know, a, a reference. And so I sat down, this guy in a cheap polyester shoot, suit shows up, he was some kind of Air Force officer in a past life. And now he was conducting these interviews. And um, 
I have, I have a mentor um, who's a Navy veteran, and um, I, I had asked him to sort of brief me on the interview process beforehand so that I could do a good job for my colleague, you know, and, but this guy didn't have time to brief me, so I botched it completely. <laughs> so um, basically, um, it was funny because when I was talking to him about the debrief, you know, I'm like, so he's like, how did it go? And I'm like, well, it's like, did the guy show up in a cheap polyester suit? I'm like, how did you know? He's like, those guys are told they have to wear suits, and that's the only suit they can afford. So they oh, nice. The cheap polyester that's suits. Crazy. So it's kind of funny. And, and the guy asked these weird questions, like, is he a good American? Would he ever do anything to harm the country? You know, yada, yada, yada. Uh, does he have any addictions, any vices? And I think what they're trying to ascertain, although I probably have this wrong, is... Is there anything that could be leveraged against them to get them to divulge information um, about government secrets? Yeah. So, you know, it yeah. doesn't matter if the person has, you know, a legal vice habit, we'll say, of some kind. You know, like if they're a heavy drinker or like if they like prostitutes in Nevada in a place where it's legal, whatever. I think what it matters more, and, and I'm probably going to get this wrong, so, you know, send all hate mail to podcast at sk.solutions. Uh, but I, I think what... Um, they're looking for is are they ashamed of having you know like drinking a lot or are they ashamed of that because if that's the case you know then that could be leveraged to get them to turn and so that's yeah. that's security vulnerability and so yeah it's kind yeah. of interesting um yeah this this particular person ended up not getting it because um they're actually a first generation mm -hmm. immigrant and they had family in china which i guess isn't the best friends with the united states government and so um, the concern was that, you know, like if they got a hold of this person's grandmother or something, you know, they might be turned that way, which is, is kind of legitimate. I mean, it's it's messed yeah. up. Like it's a horrible scenario that you never want to envision, but it, it kind of makes sense, like from all perspectives. Yeah, that's a whole different world. That's yeah. a whole different world. Um, it's, a, it's very complicated. Um, 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 I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but I was reading a book earlier last year, uh, the history of innovation. Oh, cool. Okay? And, and, and he talks about, um, he talks about two things that happened just pre 9-11, okay? This is 2020 timeframe. Uh, apparently somebody in Minneapolis, um, aircraft trainer uh, calls into the FBI line and say, hey, a bunch of, um, 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 you know, Arab nationals have undergone training at our um, flight training center, but they're not showing up to land the aircraft or something like that. They just learn how to take off and, and maneuver in flight, but they're not coming into to land. And it, it was there in the, in the FBI system. Uh, uh, somebody logged in this uh, anomaly and said this happened. Simultaneously, or maybe two, three months apart, an FBI agent in, in Arizona, somewhere in the Phoenix area, um, in, during some kind of cross-examination, hears some threats with, with airplanes um, uh, you know, in the US. And he actually reports it. He's an FBI agent. So he puts it in the system, whatever their system is called. You know, we, those days used to have the intranet. Yeah, right. That makes sense. And both of these pieces of information don't intersect. It gets lost. And it comes to light after 9-11 happened. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes when, when these guys go about doing all these silly things, um, uh, I guess there is a rationale to it. Somewhere, um, somewhere somebody will catch something and end up saving a catastrophe for you all. Hope. You hope. Know. I mean, yeah, definitely. There's definitely a weird middle ground where it can get a little bit creepy because you you wonder you know am I going to be misconstrued due to some some error in computing, but then you know what you talked about with the human in the loop right so like okay well we we say something's amiss and so oh no 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 that's now false positive you know as you were that yeah. definitely makes it less scary for sure yeah um and yeah. then if you can avert a nine eleven I mean you know obviously you want to so yeah. Right. Anyway, in, in, in this book, uh, he uses this to talk about um, um, access to information and, and the fact that, you know, uh, organizations like the FBI are necessarily KG and you've got all kinds of, you know, a few your eyes only kind of rules. Uh, this never bubbled up. Whereas if all of this information was in some place and you had uh, a 
a platform kind of environment, this would have actually been uh, looked into by somebody. Yeah. And then he talks about how platforms are actually helping create innovation and all of that kind of stuff. But no, it makes a lot of sense. Another, yeah, fascinating book again. But uh, but yeah, yeah, I remember that um, when you said your your interview for for <laughs> somebody to get certified yeah, yeah. or clearance. I, I think I, I say I bungled it kind of jokingly, but I mean, it wasn't anything I said that caused them not to get their clearance. It was. <laughs> and you have no way of knowing, right? It could yeah. be a bunch of things uh, that other people said. There were other interviews. There's a, there's so much more in terms of It was of the data. fact you that they had family in China that they cared about. <laughs> was, yeah. was, that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. Which, I mean, you know, nothing wrong with that. But, you know, I mean, like, again, it's, it's a weird shade of gray because I, I understand the U.S. government's perspective. I also, you know, I'm still friends with this person and, you know, feel bad that they weren't able to work on certain things they wanted to. So, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So I guess, are there any, <laughs> it's probably a loaded question. Tell me if you don't want to answer this, but I guess going into to sort of government data collection and um, looking at, you know, like how you could avoid a 9-11 and maybe the some of the privacy concerns that would come with that. Is there any kind of concern you'd have or do you have any professional boundaries where like you say, like, I don't want to work on this particular thing? So for instance, like most of my career, I didn't want to work on um, lethal systems for defense. Um, but then there've been a few times where I've been like, I could probably work on that particular lethal system. So I don't know, I'm probably not painting myself in a great light here. <laughs> I guess I'm just interested. No, um, I don't know how to answer that question. I'll, I'll give you two two very different examples. Sure. Um, so one is, um, while at Infosys, uh, you know, handling this aerospace sector, right? We had um, uh, a, an investor group uh, that, that, didn't want its funds to be used in anything to do with warfare or or things like that. Um, and I mean, obviously, we didn't do anything of that nature. We were just developing systems in in you know those kinds of stuff. But they wanted to speak with somebody on the ground that could actually talk to them about the kind of work we were doing. Um, so it's kind of you know it, in in that sense, it makes you aware of how how people are actually thinking and. And, and how some of those decisions um, are made. For me, it was an eye-opener. So I had that conversation with them, completely honest, transparent, openly telling them what we were doing. Um, and um, obviously it didn't impact um, any decision because we didn't do anything on the, on, on the military side of things. Yeah. Uh, another was I, I was having a really good conversation with this company, a fairly large corporation uh, in Austin. And he brought in um, a, a piece of equipment. Uh, it, it, it's like a helmet and you had a camera on it. And he said they actually ran this POC in San Diego where you, you have somebody that's released from prison and uh, the person's still on parole, but um, uh, you, you put that person out there and follow them, okay? Now, say that person's gone into a house you have a, a, a cop in plain clothes actually go and knock on that door. Now he's wearing that, that camera unit that's not visible out there. Now you walk in, the door opens, you do a quick scan and the application in the back is doing facial recognition. Interesting. And identifying, this is, this is quite some time back already. I'm talking about five, six years ago. Oh, wow. Uh, and they said the government shut the project down because, um, you know, um, it violated all kinds of um, uh, rules and laws. Uh, to my mind, um, I was a little conflicted about it. I thought, you know, if you you are being presented with an opportunity to to apprehend, um, you know, some bad guys, you might want to use it. Um, but in that case, uh, they weren't allowed to. We went on, of course, to talk about, you know, using some part of that technology in in helmets that that footballers wear, right? This whole concussion thing was 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 all the rage at that point in time and said, you know, put sensors into those helmets and actually when somebody has a fall, rather than come and do this kind of simple test, use data to 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 analyze, you know, how jarring that fall was and see if this this Oh, really interesting. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And 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 we discuss something of that nature. But but yeah, going back to what you were saying, um 
I was a little conflicted at that point in time. I so I don't know where yeah. I would stand um, till I'm presented with the use case. I guess I completely uh, agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and I mean, I, I kind of gave the example of my own flip floppiness just to sort of point out. I mean, I don't have an agenda here. I'm just kind of BSing. But for me, it was. Um, I don't know that there's a hard and fast line because I feel like when you think about an actual situation, you know, there's always a good argument for either side. Um, I mean, maybe not always, like there might be some extenuating circumstances. Like there's certainly jobs I've walked away from because it just didn't feel right. And I'm sure you've done the same, but I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like nothing's really so cut and dry that there's, there's always a clear answer. And Especially when you're long, yeah. young, it's easy to say that. Like, I would never, ever work on this. And they're like, well, wait on a sec, you know, like, I mean. Yeah, there's always a, there's a, there's always the other side of the coin, right? Um, like in this case, for example, you know, there were concerns that it could be misused. That's the whole discussion with the Patriot Act and all of that, right? Some people all for it, some people about, you know, how you can, how you can misuse it. Um, so I guess you got to weigh, you got to weigh the pros and the cons, but um, and even then, you're always going to have actually... 9-11s or like an innocent person that gets harassed unnecessarily, you know, and, and you know, there's there's always going to be an edge case. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those are all uh, tough calls. Those are all tough calls made, I guess, on, on yeah, how, how, the, how the merits stack up at that point in time. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I'm, I'm with you on that. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. any, I guess, any kind of industries that you'd like to break into that you haven't gotten a chance to work with yet? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, we're talking with a few folks on the marketing side. Interesting. Um, That's cool. Yeah. Um, uh, not, not just this whole, you know, social listening and all that kind of stuff, but, 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 um, there is a concern now with uh, Google doing away with some of these cookies and giving information out. Where are you going to get the signals um, to be able to, for marketing companies to run their um, ads and stuff like that? We've done some interesting, you know, POCs and early stage discussions on that. So, for example, say, um, you know, you send out these samples to to be, to people to taste and give you feedback on how it is, right? Pre-launch. Nice. Um, yeah, and. You know, nowadays what they're doing is they're sending them over and having you record it. So either an app or, you know, like like a video call, you have that and then, you know, record your feedback immediately. They really want to know, you know, um, how, how effective it is. Now, we are actually able to create algorithms that would look at look at the person conducting the survey and um, and and detect micro emotions. Sometimes when you come down to actually, you know, filling in the information, uh, there are certain aspects of it that don't necessarily translate when you when you provide the feedback, whereas uh, the camera and the algorithm can actually catch those kinds of micro emotions uh, as well, and and lend more credence then to to survey data. That's pretty cool. Uh, so so are, if you hesitate whole... before you check a box for in, box for instance, I feel like yeah, and yeah. and 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 there are there's there's a lot of thought um, and discussions we've had internally. Uh, in in that area, uh, in terms of how we might in, impact some of these marketing, and the beauty of marketing is you've got tons of data. Oh, I love right? working on marketing. The volumes of data, yeah. <laughs> the, the, anywhere that you've got data, you know, our our data scientists want to go in and see how how we can we can put it to use. But yeah, that may be an area that we haven't really done a great deal of work in as yet. Yeah, that's really cool. It actually sounds super duper interesting, um, and I feel like treating any survey like that i mean that has much broader application i mean you could use that in all manner of research um yeah. psychology i mean probably even and uh, this is so I, I recently read this book unwinding anxiety and the guy talks about having apps to help people quit smoking or overeating where they'll have to rate you know how much they want another piece of chocolate for instance from negative 10 to 10. And then the fact that the scale starts with negative 10 creates a psychological implication in the person's brain where, you know, if it's zero to 10, you're like, well, it's two. I could still eat that chocolate. It's like negative three. Oh, that's going to cause me pain to eat that chocolate. I'm not going to eat that, you know? And so it's interesting. Yeah. You can sort of plant an idea that way, which is, 
maybe not entirely the point of a survey, but it's it's an interesting side effect of of asking the question in a different way. So I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, marketing might be might might be one area where where I think there's a lot of um dollars and energy and, and data um where we'd love to, you know, get a look see. That's awesome. Maybe sometime in the future. Yeah, it sounds so, like fun. I, I did some work in advertising briefly for an agency called Deep Local, where um, our, our whole thing was um, creating like these robots uh, and then giving a big brand the credit for it. So there's this video on YouTube of, of cars with lift that were like the horns are honking and playing pop songs. And um, in my time, I worked briefly on a project for Google where you would shake a spray can and then we used a certain vision system to track the location of infrared beacons on the outside of a 3d printed like spray plume coming off the can um, and then there were inertial measurement units inside the can so you'd shake it and it made a rattling sound and then you could spray graffiti onto monitors and then you could erase it you know with a gesture and so that was that was for google and then mm. there was one for um hallmark for a product that um didn't do so well at market, but it was uh, like a giant microphone for kids to be able to talk to Santa Claus. So that was uh, that was an interesting thing to work with. So well, it was a normal size microphone, but then we made a giant one to, you know, be like a you know, it's where you'd put all the product in stores. And then I realized marketing and advertising are different, but this was my work in advertising, um, which is a close cousin of marketing. Um, and then. The other one that I worked on that was kind of interesting was this um, Old Navy selfie bration machine, which was uh, a bunch of balloons on a billboard, and you would take a selfie. The company did a lot with selfies, and um, basically the idea was to leverage the social media um, from people posting hashtag selfie bration um, to create buzz for Old Navy, uh, the client, and then what would happen if you put that hashtag on was that you're picture would get sucked into uh, the computer program, which would then rasterize it and you'd have one of four different inflation amounts on a balloon. Um, and it would make your picture in balloons, um, you know, and basically like they're pixels, black and white. And so nice. I think there were five miles of wire in the final um, product. And um, I think they ran it in New York and Los Angeles. I, I was, this was really early in my career. So I was only an intern there, but um, it was just interesting to work with these big brands and, and on some of these products. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's actually the, the extent that the depth that you can go into um, in, in, in some of these marketing efforts is, um, is really fascinating. Uh, yeah. Not, not something that I'm very, uh, knowledgeable about, but uh, every time I hear somebody talking about what they're trying to do on that marketing side, uh, seems like an eye opener to me. Well, it seems like something that you know Roundsquare can probably help with from everything you've said. Yeah. I mean, you've got a lot of relevant work in other industries where I mean, just the stories you've told me today would would translate over to that pretty well, I would think. Yeah, it, it, yeah, we've 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 only scratched the surface. Had some very early discussions. I'd love to get some some actual projects work going on that. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I'm, I'm sure you will, given, given your history. Eve eventually, yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a there's a lot of interest, a lot of buzz, and you know, yeah, we've been having some really interesting conversations. Um, like I said, in multitude of industries. So yeah, it's only a matter of time, I suppose. Yeah, for sure. So I feel like we're hitting a good kind of plateau here. Is is there anything you want to plug? Uh, if we're if we're gonna like close it out soon. Uh, nothing really. I mean, um, um, yeah, I, I think at the very beginning, you know, we talked about, uh, who we are, what we do. And, um, I, I guess it's pretty self-evident somebody that's actually listening to that, uh, or, or watching this would know how effectively we could be used. So nothing to plan. Okay. Excellent. Thank um, you. well, if round score is a website, we'll certainly put that in the description which I'm sure you don't, I, just I didn't look because my power was out right before this episode. But Bash, <laughs> thanks for coming on. You're awesome. I really, really enjoyed getting to know you better today. Um, we should do this again sometime. Um, this was a lot of fun. Thank you. Likewise, likewise, man. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.
If you've stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button. Or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.